All right, Sky. Let's talk about what we have come to call copyright. It sounds unsexy when you put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> You're like artistic ownership it has this beautiful poetic propagandistic just comes right out and it feels like it's already part of the legal <laughs> framework of some very important institution <laughs> and it stands in contrast to this sort of you know squirrely like oh it's creative commons open source copy left and you don't exactly have a way to put it that sounds as robust. Well, uh, because uh, it's not that the latter is spoken of in terms that are less accurate or less, even arguably less sexy. It's that the former is a propagandistic term. Artistic ownership, or more broadly, we might say, we say intellectual property. Like these two monstrous words. Property? My property? Like You mean like my genes? You know, like... <laughs> Like my Jeep? <laughs> no, intellectual. <laughs> oh, intellectual property because I'm smart. Right. So I own things because I'm smart. Who would dare question that? Who would dare take that away? <laughs> right. And you can protect that. You can have that. Like, right. Protect. Who doesn't want to protect? <laughs> right. 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 Bring it into a court of law. <laughs> you know? Right. It all sounds so proper. Um... Yeah, I mean, obviously your question is super solid. Why does... What are the underlying reasons? What can we break that apart into? Right. Why is it a harder pitch? Talk about your jeans and your Jeep for a second. One thing you'll notice right away is that if someone steals your jeans, you're standing there in your underwear. And notice how this other thing that we're told to call property, this intellectual property, doesn't work that way. If someone steals your song, you don't even know about it. You still have your song. You didn't lose it. Right. Nothing was actually stolen in the sort of most traditional or, or literal sense that we use that word. It's a different thing. Right. It's not a physical thing. Did Prometheus steal fire from the gods? Like, this is an old... Con I think that's one thing we need to realize. This is a very old controversy. The idea the, of relating the copying of something which gives power to heretofore underpowered communities. Equating that with stealing is a common trope across a number of styles and socio-political milieu of power grabs. And really, if you think about it, it's what Prometheus did, right? He took fire, that can, something that can be copied quite easily if you have the appropriate media onto which to copy it, and because he gave that to a group that hadn't yet been empowered by having a copy of Fire, he was cast as having stolen something from the gods. 
stolen something that differentiated the rights holders <laughs> from everyone else. Right. Right. Did he claim to be like the you know, we're going to run probably to our edge of an understanding of Greek mythology. We need like Rachel Lagodka or someone who knows this stuff. Like, um, so I don't know. I'm going to I'm going to punt back to uh, the like contemporary intellectual property thing. But I would like to know. The question is, did Prometheus have any kind of part of the origin story of fire? I think. So let's think about if I'm. Prometheus in this moment or whatever like the person holding the guitar what do they have to say about ownership in contrast to copying first because this is your question is did Prometheus have an ownership interest this is where your mind goes naturally right of course of course I think that's the, the conflict of interest is, is that person like pretending to Well, let me ask you that. So, I don't know how well Sky can be heard, but the, the, the basically the point that you're making is that you run really a foul when you claim to have created something that you didn't. Then, then you're in a whole nebulous zone of even you're not even intellectual anymore. <laughs> like the, the property is, you know, either not yours or not existed, but certainly it's not of your intellect, right? What's going on right now? Is this my property? Because I'm not even touching the guitar. Everything that's coming out right now is through a loop that I made ages ago. And, you know, by that I mean whatever. It's been a minute and ten seconds or something, right? And, like, so I'm not playing this live, right? This is something that is kind of dead now. And I'm making what I want of it. To whom does it belong? Who is the creator? Am I the creator just because I sat here and pressed some buttons on the loop pedal and, and you know, strummed some strings on the guitar? Or is it because we set this up together and we had certain ideas about how to set up the room? Like, how do we get to the point where we understand ownership? I'm just, it's just a G chord and then an F and then there's like, you know, a, a, an a, a, a B flat. Right. Certainly I didn't, there's very little that you could claim that I invented here. Right, that's the thing, right? When money comes into the picture, then everybody wants to say they own it. Exactly. exactly. But that's, I don't think that is something fundamental to the art. That's just an artifact of the system by which we have created these weird little wellsprings of income. And everyone tries to rent seek by making a little ring around the spring. Wherever it is that you can make money from art, but th that's actually really, like, it, you think of it like art is actually a whole beautiful field that's, like, constantly sprouting and there's all kinds of cross-pollination. And then there's, like, a giant piece of construction paper laid over the field with a few holes poked in it so the art can grow through, right? And everyone kind of goes around all the... You know, I mean, we'll get into it, but like, my mind goes to the RIAA, which I know I talk a lot of shit about the RIAA. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's the way you have to realize is that's the reason that we seek ownership in when a song, when art starts to generate the idea that we could actually generate some kind of economy from it. I think the only reason that that triggers our ownership reflex is, is not anything to do with the song, not anything to do with the underlying creative process or ownership or who you're handing it out to or any of that stuff. It's just merely an artifact of the system of control that's been laid over it. Yeah. Namely... how this works.
so if you make something beautiful, the story goes, and you copyright it, it becomes yours. You go through whichever portions of the process make sense to you. You arrive then at a state where, by dint of you owning it, having this intellectual property, someone does something with your property that might help them generate economy, even in the abstract, even reputation alone, then the state is going to send the cops after them on your behalf. Aren't you proud? You're the proud owner. It's not like your jeans where the cops will go and get them back and you can put them on and be like, oh, that feels better, my jeans are back. You're not recovering any part of the art. You're recovering an imagined sum at best. Usually you're recovering nothing, but in the hypothetical, you're recovering an imagined sum of how much you lost from the opportunity. The opportunity that you lost because someone else thought your thing was cool enough to try to remix it. talk about the news and these things, but like this morning, I don't know if you saw, it was like number one on Hacker News. Was um, an article about the SEC filing from Netflix, which already, you know, I don't love the idea that that's even the way that the market is organized from first principles is that you have to have an SEC filing that shows, for example, your competition. In this case, I already don't love that as an organizing principle, but, but there's worse things in the universe. In this case, Netflix says, well, piracy is, one, is our primary competition. I don't want to misquote them. They, it might not have said that, but they listed piracy several times as part of the structure of their competition. Now, I mean, in some ways, Netflix has my admiration insofar as that they actually took head on, they took a look at the system and said, hey, it's trivial to copy bytes across the wire. and People are using this triviality to bring fire down from the gods, to copy movies, share them with each other. And Netflix sought out to make something they sought out to make something that was so easy to use and comprehensive that people would decide to use it instead. Right? And I think that's actually a pretty good deed. There's a lot I don't like about Netflix, of course. Now, of course, it's frustrating. I pay for, I don't know, Netflix and Hulu and I don't know what else, a bunch of them, right? Yeah. And I almost never use a lot of them. So let's say there's a competitor that comes out that's called, like, Jetflix. Yeah. You know? And they copy all of the same strategies and movies. That they pretend to be Netflix, but that they they don't 
abide the intellectual property system and, right. and yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think first of all, as critics of the system, we have to acknowledge up front that that will in the very near term cause money that is flowing to creators to stop flowing. I don't deny that. Right. So I think there's a there's a difference between like 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 an endearing copying, you know, an inspirational form versus trying to protrude or pretend to be that entity. Yeah, 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 I agree with that. There's right. a difference between what we today call piracy, which, you know, copying bytes is very, is not in and of itself fraudulent. It's not fraudulent until you claim, so this is why I release most of my music as Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike International. I think the current version, or the one that I use for my music is 4.0, because that's the one that was current when we did Nanny State Fiddler, I think. Yeah. And... I do attribution share alike basically for the reasons that you're talking about. And in other words, to recognize the difference between remixing my thing without my permission, which I, I don't believe I could ever give permission to do. I don't think that I have that moral authority. Once I play this note, it's bouncing off the walls. It's, it's not mine anymore. It stopped being mine as soon as the felt experience of the present moment of the string vibrating ended to me. And all this, all this contrived moral authority around it, involving the state and the cops, feels profoundly contradictory to the, the exercise of making the art in the first place. But I, I, I take your point that so you're, you're misrepresenting its providence, saying, hey, I made this, taking something that came out of a moment of mine, and for someone else to say they made it feels different. Right. But I, I, to be perfectly honest, even though we do attribution share alike, I still don't think it's the government's business or the cop's business that someone else said they, that someone claimed they made something. I don't actually feel wonderful about that protection. So I'd say, just from what I gathered, you're coming at it from like a sonic offering. It's like, a, it's like an offering of sound to the universe, to people, like a, like a gift. I don't know how, I'm worried you can't be hurt, so I'm going to repeat. Yeah. Wait, okay. what Sky just said was that it sounds like my approach is that it's an offering, a sonic offering. That the actual, the actual affection is just a gift and it's not ownable. Right. Yeah, that's about how I feel. But that is not, and this is the important part of this whole critique, I think this is where it turns into something real. That is not the same as saying that I can't derive economy from it. The question is, in a world where fire has been brought down from the gods, in a world where we have extremely high bandwidth connections to one another, we can trivially copy bytes, how do we leverage that ability? The fact that we can so easily copy bytes, how do we leverage that as a source of economy? Rather than viewing it as a threat, how do we view it as a fount, as a part of what we are, who we are, and how we approach the, the sonic offering, as you say. Yeah. yeah, because in a lot of cases with music, like, if you have a remix that blows up, that's kind of like the best free marketing you can get for your song. You know, even if they are making a ton of money. Yeah, there's so many examples. I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's like the best free marketing for your song that you can get. So, I think then the... Are you, are you dialing back my feedback? But I can do that just by turning away. Oh, actually, that's nice. 
So thinking about, you know, we just put out a record with 10 songs, nine of which are Creative Commons. We did the one cover of the Final Fantasy IX, and I just claim no copyright over that, but I just credit the author. Um, and the way that I think, this is the one thing I do kind of value, um, like DistroKid for, is they like do the paperwork part of that, <laughs> yeah. whatever that is. That's kind of nice. Like, uh, I wish that paper part didn't exist, but I do, I do respect that pay, that, that DistroKid and to some extent CE Baby um, represent a hair more than rent seeking in so far as that they do like that legwork. Yeah. But the point stands. We released a Creative Commons record, and. Um, And now we have 30-something people that own artifacts by dint of they are contributing to the cryptographic release of that record. Right. Now that to me so far is quite unimpressive. <laughs> it's kind of the, it, it it's maybe it's slightly better than the gobbledygook of intellectual property copyright insofar as that We've successfully erased the part where the cops can be called. That's exciting. But it's still empty in so far as that it doesn't do anything of utility. So let's think for a second, let's go in a very different direction and talk about like scalping and the ticket side of things for live events. Because this now we're talking about, we've removed this concept of intellectual property more or less. Nobody really owns the show. Everybody recognized that the show is a series of moments. It has these qualities that we're talking about wanting to identify and, and identify the economy of, okay. But it has a different kind of rent seeking where you have obviously Ticketmaster and others are, uh, they have monopolistic tendencies as, you know, you know, we, go back to Pearl Jam's testimony before the House Committee in the 90s, you know, years and years ago, most of those issues are still relevant or even unchanged in some way, probably. Now we also have, like, the StubHub thing. And it seems pretty obvious to me that what's actually happening there is that there is some kind of a straw sale or even a non-sale where there's a, a retail price of 60 something dollars and then often the very same day there's no tickets available except on a supposed secondary market for hundred and forty dollars right. and I'm sure that Ticketmaster and all the rest have found a way to game that system I'm sure they're making a bunch of that money totally. so one approach potentially I'm sure I'm not the first person to think of this, and even if I am, I don't own it. <laughs> One approach is to say, well, we'll have a smart contract, your ticket is an NFT, uh, 
and part of the ERC 721 contract says that before it can be transferred, it essentially goes into an open market. Like you're not allowed to sell it to an individual person. You have to sell it to whoever will pay this price. Or it could be an auction, but let's do the fixed price notion for a second. And then of course, you know, if it's, you wanna go, you got a general admission ticket that people are really hot for. Like, man, when I saw Green Sky here in St. Pete, it was crazy. There's so many people flying fingers outside. And I feel like, you know, in our kind of dinky little St. Pete with, with Green Sky, it's still, like, I, I, you know, it's maybe under the radar where Ticketmaster, like, I think a lot of people did actually, like, me pay only 30 bucks or whatever. <laughs> um, but the way that you can imagine it working is that you would you would sign up and say hey I want a ticket and then when tickets when anyone wants to sell it on the secondary market the only way to transfer the NFT is to engage with that mechanism and say oh you have to put it on the open market for this price okay well then you run into like a civil attack where I could just set up a ton of bidders a ton of I want this and so you kick the can a little bit down the road Okay, but what if over the course of time, and I, I don't have illusions that I'll ever be this big, but other artists will, where the album artifact, like maybe if you come and get the album artifact signed by me, here's, here's a vision. We, we do see a legitimate cryptographic signature goes on the blockchain only in person. You have to bring the artifact to me and we do an interactive ceremony right there that causes the signature to be emitted and as the owner now of a signed artifact, maybe you can be a bidder or a buyer or authorize a bidder or a buyer to overcome the civil attack. So now you have, now you have this fusion of the economy of the album, the $26,000 or whatever we raise on the album with the economy of the show. And each of them are kind of each of them are helping the other overcome the rent-seeking industrial tendencies. And that's just a super duper basic example. I think as we, as we start to think through um, like feature fitness for the, the market for artifacts, especially as it starts to be a co-mingled market with other musicians, not just us. I think the features are going to become pretty, the desired features are going to become pretty evident. And it's the people who want to go see the shows that are going to be in a great position to tell us what the features are. Like we have a ready-made audience, especially if we keep growing these shows. So I think that in a nutshell, I mean, that's not quite a nutshell. I don't know that's 20 minutes or something, but I think that's kind of the way that you think about um, evolving beyond the illusion that there's any property here and the double illusion that it's intellectual in nature. <laughs> uh, if this is really just about creating economy around the music, then what you need is feature fitness, meaning features that match your, your crowd, yep. and you need those features to be available. Yep. And I think any time someone tries to click play and they can't hear your song, that is just stopping the emergence of those features. That has nothing to do to me with creating economy for your song. The only reason you tell somebody who wants to hear your song they can't when they click play is because your back is against a wall and there's no way in the orthodox system to generate economy except telling them no. So what's happened is the system, the intellectual property industrial complex has pitted us against our fans and told us that the only way we can, our only meal ticket is telling our fans, no, you can't press play until. And that's just palpably obviously untrue. And this is not new to crypto. This is this critique was made loudly, proudly, successfully, and well researched by the Grateful Dead. You know? 
there was a great reluctance by the Grateful Dead to, you know, th there was controversy where they were expected to tell the people taping their shows no, to get in their face, to take some kind of enforcement action, to become violent against these people that loved their music so much that they were indexing metadata before, long before that was a cool thing to do on the well and on even predating the well via snail mail. So, like this precedent, not only a precedent, but a precedent that is part of our community and culture is very available because that controversy of taping and also of the, the incident with the original Macintosh firmware where some members of the Grateful Dead were able to reverse engineer it, I don't know how many people know that story, that led quite directly to the, the founding of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I mean, before that, and, I, and this really, if you all haven't read uh, Mother American Night, John Perry Barlow's book, we'll talk about this more in other talks. I'm sure I'll bring it up again and again, but um, it's really laid bare how the degree to which the Electronic Frontier Foundation existed before it was called that. Before, before that name was given to it, it was just part of the Grateful Dead. But it, it, it was in full swing before it was called that. And then, of course, you know, we have the subsequent evolution to our current stature and, and to, uh, you know, with the Electronic Frontier Foundation often, in my mind, on the side of musicians when the industry is being... I, I don't want to use an adjective. Let's say this. Look at what the RIAA is being asked to do. Here, I'm going to stand in defense of the RIAA for a minute. Um, <laughs> Given the current shape of the industry, anyone trying to, even if they're being honest, trying to advocate on behalf of musicians is being pulled in two very different directions. One of them is to steward in the, the industry, to keep track of the numbers, to provide insights about how, where, and by whom or with whom sales are occurring. And then ostensibly to do some advocacy to like, you know, go to the, the Spotify's and the Netflix's of the world and demand a little more for the musicians, a little more for, for our constituents. That's on one hand. On the other hand, the hand, you know, that they're dealt is one where the tools that they have to do that are enforcement actions based on intellectual property and nothing else. And so, what I think happens is, if you think about um, little circles of rent seeking and closing the fountains of art economy, Spotify is maybe the very best example in, in the universe for that. Um, what happens is those, uh, whoever's moving in on that enclosure, and here it's Spotify with the RIAA and, and all of them, not just Spotify. I mean, Tidal and all of them, all of them. And uh, there are obviously parallels with the motion picture industry and, and, and all over the place. They become the constituencies of the industry associations. In other words, the RIAA, we're not really their constituents. We, we don't have, we don't vote for them. We don't have any way of influencing their policy other than making good arguments, which I think we're doing. But the RIA, I, their constituents are just as much Spotify. They're just as much an artifact of the regulatory capture by which big industry players have amassed such a force and assumed such a position that they now have become the constituent for what is ostensibly the industry association. And so I think you get RIA often advocating for the Spotify model, more than for the artist's interest. They're advocating for the artist's interest, but in the context of the Spotify model, with that model being what they advance first and foremost. 
and they actually they 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 slur EFF. They have no shame about it. They call them everything for free, and they mean it. It's funny because I'm like everything for free. That sounds like a world I want to live in. They mean it as a pejorative. <laughs> you know. But um. I, I, everything for free without a cost. Yeah. Oh, at an enormous cost. To, 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 right. At a, at a cost at the point of consumption. At a cost to society. At a cost to remix culture. At a cost to curiosity. Yeah. At a cost to like just human decency. Yeah. A cost. It is a cost to human decency. Yeah. yeah. I think so. I mean, the fact that it took whatever a hundred years for Steamboat Willie to be available, yeah, yeah there, there's a, it, it begins to impinge on human de decency at some point. Yeah. So, but I think that it's just amazing to me that they could be so, you know. I always feel the need to disclaim. I'm not even a big Grateful Dead fan. I can name maybe 12 Grateful Dead songs even. I'm not, I don't, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I love going to see Uncle John's band here. Shout out to them uh, in St. Pete. They're, they're one of the best Grateful Dead cover bands I've ever seen. I'll always go see a Grateful Dead cover band when they're in town. Love seeing Billy Strings do their covers. I love seeing our friend Christian Ward, who's on our record, play with uh, Grass is Dead. He does beautiful covers. Um, the Traveling McCurries, man. Oh, aren't they doing the most incredible dead covers right now? Oh, I think Christian just played with them. You see that? He just played with them at the Grand Old Opry like a couple nights ago. Yeah. Hey, Christian, if you're listening to this, you're killing it, bud. <laughs> um, Christian's on my record, Vowel Sounds. Hope If you haven't checked it out yet, I hope you do. Um... I'm not, I, I, I don't have the like de devotee status toward the Grateful Dead, their catalog, their shows. Um, they're not my favorite band. I, I deeply, deeply respect their stewardship of traditionals. That's my main interest in them. Um, but it's becoming increasingly clear to me that they set something off in the industry. They, they awoke a sleeping giant. They were not ever in the top like five commercial commercially successful acts it, it, in their heyday, right. right? And yet, the the they seem to have really torn a big section off of that construction paper I was describing, right? They seem to have really illuminated something underneath there that lives completely outside the intellectual property industrial complex, and that that fosters a. a deep sense of cross-pollination and fertility with regard to the emergence of art and, and, the, and the emergence of how economy can be generated from art. I think that's very important. Um, and so I think it's super obvious that, you know, the Electronic Frontier Foundation and, and archive.org carry on that energy so, um, you know, so, uh, Transparently, I would just say they embody that energy because they are that band still in some ways. And um, so it's just funny to me that the RIAA, they, they, have no, they have no compunctions, essentially, about slurring the Grateful Dead. They, they'll call it the EFF and say it's everything for free. But what they're really slurring there is the model that came from the taping culture of the Grateful Dead and then eventually from, um, from John Perry Barlow's work. And they, they, you know, it just tells you something about pitting these two constituencies against one another. On one hand, the industry players, if you want to, I mean, industry players is such a cliche term, but you know, the, that, the tightest ring of rent seeking. They, they openly are, are prepared to essentially side with Spotify. Of course, they, they don't call it that. They, they, they couch it as advocacy for the artists. 
but they'll side with with Spotify and Rent Seeking over Grateful Dead. When those two are very clearly, you, you can see each of their corners and you can hear the announcer announcing each of their names and you can hear the bell and you can see them going to the center of the ring and the RIA reliably cheers for Spotify. Right. Well, are they benefiting from the financial aspects of it? <laughs> I mean, let's think about this. Is their headquarters in... Nashville? Now, even if it was, you know, I mean, my sense of Nashville is that it's largely a finance, a music finance city more than a music city. Um, but no, right? It's not in Nashville. Is there headquarters in San Francisco or Asheville or Austin or Portland or St. Petersburg or any other place where there's these, in Detroit, uh, where there are these um, emergent economies to be discovered from music industry evolution, New Orleans. Right. No. Their headquarters is in Washington, D.C. <laughs> so I think like, and, and, and you know what? If I was in charge of the RIA, you know where my headquarters would be? In Washington, D.C. Like, it makes perfect sense. I get it. Like, I, and, and I, in, a, in, a, in a limited way, I'm for it. You know, I, I do recognize that there is a lot to go to bat for with in terms of laws and, and regulations and policies. Um, I'm just curious to see what happens to the RIA evolve if indeed um, if copying bites is unstoppable which it seems like it is and if the economies that we and other similarly positioned artists are trying to introduce become successful and it seems like they're starting to be then I'm very curious to see what we can do to you know, I would love to be friends with the RIA. I hope that's the future. You know what I mean? I hope the future is that they am realizing that the rent seekers as constituencies is an unsustainable model. The, yeah. the internet is way too strong to ever tolerate that. The speed at which bytes can be copied is way too fundamental a force in the universe to ever abide that. So instead, their constituents can be the association of the artists that they claim to represent in their title of their organization. You know? Yeah. I didn't mean to really go off on the RIA like that so much. And like I said, I do hope, I hope they have a, a future of contributing. Thank you. 
I think the summation of this discussion is basically that, uh... That it's helpful to recognize that we are relatively small vessels as humans, as musicians, as intellectuals, to the degree that that word can be used when paired with property. <laughs> and, um... It behooves us to just kind of examine what the mathematics of the universe, which we cannot change, what they suggest to us with regard to policy outcomes. And I think the mathematics of the universe, maybe it goes back to Prometheus, maybe not, I don't know, but the mathematics of the universe appear to suggest that copying is meant to be easy. We, we see this in, you know, biochemistry as well, you know, the, the replication of DNA and so on. And even in more fundamental forces. It appears that the most fundamental particles, principles, waves, the most fundamental laws that we have to describe how the universe works, those laws don't prohibit copying. They encourage it. And so... As we participate in being a party to the evolutionary emergence of the internet, I think it behooves us to teach the machines, to teach the internet what we have learned about how the mathematics of the universe work and what we have learned from the misadventures of the intellectual property industrial complex going back to the Greek gods. It might be our most sacred duty as the last humans of the uh, <laughs> the last humans to look across the precipice before we find that the machines have capabilities that make it difficult for us to distinguish them from us. You know, I think we'll know, we'll know when machines are capable of, of loving, of really experiencing the joys of love, which sounds so far off, but so did conversational AI not that long ago. So did being a chess champion not that long ago. We'll know in part because they'll have learned the joys of sharing um, the sonic offering, as you say. Yeah. And the best we can do is to set a good example, you know.